History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. I'm Phil, and each week I'll be joined by a friendly co-host to help me break down one of history's biggest moments and the forgotten people who made them happen. Hi, I'm Vince. I'll be today's guest host. And like Phil, I'm no history expert. See, we're just two regular people who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the father of public relations. So you're going to hear some new voices on History's B-Side over the next few weeks. And today we're bringing in a guest host whose name is Vince and someone we've actually mentioned on the podcast before because he's written to us about actually introducing ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first first episode ever, I was like, introduce yourselves, guys. You need to know who you are. <laughs> we always thought we just weren't important enough to uh, be up there with the ranks of history's most influential people. And it doesn't really matter who we are, but uh, decided to bring Vince on because I know he's a, he's a good friend of ours and he's a history fan himself. So yeah, thought he would have some good input for us and he'll be with me for the next couple episodes that we do here. And then, uh, who knows, maybe in the future events will be back around for some more. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking forward to this. This should be fun. So do you want to kind of tell people a little bit about yourself and yeah, why um, you're here? <laughs> so like I said, like Phil said, my name is Vince. Um, I was born here in Borman. I'm in the same uh, area. I was actually four years older than Phil. <laughs> I was his section leader in high school. For Another trombone. band person. Another band person, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, where I met my uh, met my wife, and uh, she is actually in Phil's grade. So <laughs> <laughs> we started dating after I uh, after I graduated from from high school, and we've been married about four years now, going on five uh, this coming year. And I currently live in Dayton. I work at a local community college down there as an academic advisor. And I've been there since 2016, various positions, and I love history. I was, my undergraduate was sport business, and my, I got an MBA from Youngstown State, and my undergrad was Mountain Union. And while also there, I did radio for the Mountain Union football team. I was on the sideline, so I was a sideline reporter, and we did a weekly uh, radio event uh, for about three years. It's a once a week event mm -hmm. where we would talk about the latest things in sports and discuss debate, almost like a PTI, pardon, pardon the interruption type of thing, or the, what's the show where they're like the floating heads are there and he gives points and stuff. I don't Tony have Reality, cable. Around, the, around the horn, that okay. one. Well, I mean, we grew up with that one, I think. I don't uh, know if you're, did you, you didn't have I've never had cable in my life. So oh, really? The only, yeah, the only sports never channels mind. I watch is when I'm at work. And oh, okay. <laughs> just well, in the background it's, it's probably on, on there. Mute. <laughs> but yeah, we ended up, um, so it was kind of like that where we would just, just round table discuss different things and we had quizzes at the end, so. Um, I've always enjoyed sports. I've enjoyed history, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm looking forward to discussing. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's cool. Part of the reason I picked this topic to have you on for is because we both have a little bit of that business background. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked before about the fact that my background is in marketing, um, not in sports per se, although I've actually done that a little bit at the collegiate level too. Right. Um, but this topic is actually going to relate to marketing and specifically public relations. So I thought it would be kind of cool. I mean, it was, it was very interesting to me coming from a marketing background and just how influential that field can be when used properly. It's kind of crazy how, <laughs> how influential a lot of it is, especially when you're, when you like dig deep and realize some of the things. So like a, a good propaganda idea is if you've seen MLB or MLS major league soccer, you're a much bigger soccer fan than I am. <laughs> you know there's a team called the Columbus Crew, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's another team called Cincinnati FC. Mm -hmm. They're another professional team. on I And there's a highway that separates them. Oh, I yeah. Five. Hell is real. Hell is real. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they got that because someone put up an advertisement sign that said hell is real. And it, the next sign was like, where are you going to spend eternity or yeah, whatever? Yeah. But when they asked the fans, what do you want the rivalry to be called? Because Cincinnati FC got promoted quote unquote up to the um up to the mls basically they paid the largest expansion fee and all that type mm. of stuff because mls is greedy um <laughs> they the fans voted on hell is real they didn't really want it but 
that was the the PR campaign took off, and it's really funny to see that hashtag yeah. going on Twitter all the time when they play. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, we talked a little bit. Oh, you talked a little bit about your background, especially working in radio and things like that. So you you have a little bit of media experience, mm-hmm. um, and I have obviously dealt with that from my position working in marketing. But see, I work for a company and not like a independent firm with clients and stuff like that. So I'm always kind of on the one side of the story, which I don't know. Like I, I'm always promoting a specific brand from a specific angle, but right. you maybe slightly differently. Like you were the media, and although you were really working for one school Uh um did you ever like have to tell stories i guess you probably talked a lot about the specific students student athletes or whatever but did you have to kind of report anything in that way so whenever we had to call the games we had to make sure we weren't biased so as we presented the game to the radio fans we had to make sure we weren't totally rooting for mount union (laughs) as we as we gave the reports and stuff and we actually got people who They would call in and be like, if you want an unbiased opinion of how the team is doing, go to the student radio. They're doing a really good job. So it's one of those things where and when you're asking questions of the players and stuff after games, you got to make sure that your your questions are a little more neutral and not favoriting one side or the Mm -hmm. other and and stuff. Sometimes it's really hard, especially when the other team. Well, yeah, when you're working for the school. like (laughs) Yeah, when you're working for the school and when the other team was a jerk. So like I had (laughs) – Teams who, like, their cheerleaders at Wabash, for example, um, they were a team in the playoffs. They're an all-male school. Mm-hmm. And um, their male cheerleaders, I forget what they were called, but they wore these, like, Where's Waldo outfits. Yeah. It's really goofy. But they were, like, getting in my face and, like, chanting at me, Wabash always fights whenever they would score a touchdown. Mm-hmm. So I had a little fun with them. I would just stare at them and smirk whenever we'd score a touchdown <laughs> or an interception because I was – unfortunately, our, our equipment didn't work super well, so I was always on the opposing sideline. <laughs> but it was always fun to get into whenever I could get to the Mount Union side and you could see what they get really mad just kind of sitting there and watching them. But I had to present it a certain way and make sure that I wasn't favoriting Mount Union stuff over Wabash, especially on the sideline when I needed to find information. Did you ever view that as like part of your obligation? Not maybe not because you were told to do this as your job, but just as your like own moral obligation to be down the middle, or were you um, kind of okay just playing one side? A little bit of an, a moral obligation. I think that was also partially taught to us in our PR class. Like you need to make sure that when you're presenting something, it needs to be presented in a way that appeals to the audience and appeals to them. And sometimes that does mean enhancing and lighting up certain things like colors for teams and mascots logos but press conferences things like that but it just kind of depends and certainly understanding how a story is going to resonate with the people who are hearing it right exactly so i think a little bit of that is just knowing like knowing that you are are presenting it a proper way and even then you you still hear like when you go on twitter you see the reporters for cleveland most of the cleveland fans hate them because they're (laughs) They're either super negative or they do some sort of spin, and it could be like, well, you should be more supportive of the team. And then you've got some others who are way on the other side and super supportive of the team, but yeah, you don't like them. But a lot of the Cleveland media is super negative. I don't know if you've heard of Tony Grossi, yeah, <laughs> who said JOK hasn't done anything this year, and he didn't even re- understand why they drafted him. Which, <laughs> you're a media guy, and I understand you're trying to draw clicks by saying stupid stuff. Yeah. But (laughs) so there's that moral obligation of, I guess the moral obligation comes down to what, what helps you the most? Right. Cleveland media has decided we're going to be the heel for everything. Well, certainly what helps you the most is kind of like, I guess it's going to be the underlying theme of this episode today is like, obviously we're going to be talking about public relations and the way that stories are told, the way that they can be spinned in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, And spin is like the, the negative word when you're talking about public public relations, like you never want to use that word, even though that's really kind of your job. (laughs) Right. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about today is like looking at things from a different perspective. So while it may be spin, you don't call it spin because that's a negative term. Or while you may be taking a certain angle to something, you never really go at it in that direct route because it's just not always the most effective way. It's, it's how we can shape people to think and act in a certain way. That's going to achieve our end goal. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be, I think it's super interesting how that's even shifted today with um, social media 
because things are crafted yeah. <laughs> so differently and so open because everyone has it's either an echo chamber or it's a uh, description and if you're wrong there's it's a strictly drawn line so how's this how does pr move the needle on on even with social media interactions and today a lot of times it's like lighting a match too cuz social media amplifies things in such a way that you never really know where they're going to end up right right <laughs> But the, the guy we're going to talk about today obviously didn't have that benefit. But it's interesting the way that, like, you and I maybe learned about public relations or advertising or whatever in mm-hmm. class is all shaped by the actions of this person. Um, and I thought it was super weird that I didn't know his name. Like, I went through business school and I took marketing and advertising and public relations classes and right. I never heard this guy's name or if I did, I just completely forgot about it because it wasn't told to me he was as important or influential as he was. It was one of those high-level names that you heard because it's like, oh, he's this, and it's a blurb in a book that right. goes over whatever stuff, so then you can move forward with whatever principles are being right. taught. So this is kind of a – it's probably going to be in a longer episode, maybe not super in-depth, I guess, but just because he did so much that we're only going to scratch the surface of it, and mm-hmm. it's still going to be super dense, but – um, I guess we can get right into it. I, I, I'm going to start his bio even in the first half of this episode just because it, just <laughs> what he did was so cool and the way that he influenced his world and the impact it had on today's world I think is super interesting. And maybe that's just me being a little nerding out on the marketing side of it. That should be fun. I think it'll be interesting to see as I was looking at your uh, notes you sent me, I was like, Page scroll, page scroll, page. I was like, okay, he did a lot of stuff. Like, jeez. And some of this stuff you can still see reverberating, even from when we were kids. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like some of the brands that he worked for, the companies that he worked for, like we will recognize them today. And you could go to the supermarket and find some of them there as well. Yeah. (laughs) So this man's name was Edward Louis Bernays. He was born November 22nd, 1891 in Vienna, Austria, or Austria-Hungary at the time. Um, A year after he was born, his parents, Eli Bernays and Anna Freud, moved to New York City. Eli, his father, had been working as a grain exporter at the Manhattan Produce Exchange, so the family moved there to join him. But they moved to New York for another reason as well, which was to be closer to his uncle, a man named Sigmund Freud, who had begun to work there. That's funny. I think I've heard of him. Yeah, so he's someone who's probably not on the B side of history, <laughs> or psychology, I guess. Yeah. But you kind of tell that that was coming, you know, when you mentioned his mother's maiden name was Freud, yeah. and especially when we're talking about someone who is going to kind of be focused on the way that people think and act, it's no surprise that he was a relative of Freud. <laughs> I also didn't realize that Sigmund was in America, so... so. I think at the time he he was starting to work in New York, but he also traveled a lot, so he didn't do the majority of his work in America. But I guess when when the Bernays family would have moved to New York, Freud was currently Got there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know a ton, honestly. I don't know a ton about Sigmund Freud other than his very famous theory and his um, and that he was the father of psychoanalysis. I have no idea yeah. he was actually here in America. Yeah, I mean, he was he was very big in his time, and he's obviously huge in the field of psychology. So that's probably something that we could get into maybe on a future episode. Not him specifically, Not right but like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely someone in psychology. Because I think that's a super interesting field, too. And it ties in so well to marketing, as we will talk about mm-hmm. on this episode. Um, but I also thought it was funny that, like, Freud was Bernays uncle, but in two ways. So he was his mother's sister, but also Edward's father married Sigmund Freud's sister. So it was like two sets of... Just seems weird. <laughs> yeah. They just feels Two weird. sets of siblings that married... So he was like... So, wait. I gotta... So Edward's mother was his direct sister. Was Freud's direct sister. Okay. And then Freud... Sigmund married his dad's sister. So, like, his sister-in-law. No. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wait. Edward's mother was Freud's sister. Okay. Got that. Freud married... Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud married Edward's father's sister. You might have just said that and maybe I said it backwards. Yeah, yeah. That's what, So I said, So it sounds like he married his sister-in-law, right? Yes, but I don't know which was married first. Okay. <laughs> That's why I was like, so, yeah, like, I confused myself on that. this happen? <laughs> 
Um, yeah. Anyway, not important to the story. I just thought it was funny yeah. that Freud was his <laughs> uncle two times over. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like that weird I'm my own grandpa song that people had yeah. years ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like we said, Freud's understanding of the way that people think and behave would actually play a big role on kind of the way that Edward Bernays would one day shape this field of public relations, almost really introduce the field of public relations. Okay. Do you think Sigmund shared his theories with Edward? Almost certainly. At least he would have been very familiar with his uncle's work. Um, I don't know how much they necessarily worked together. There were, there were times that we're not going to talk about because it's not the most important part of Bernays' story, but there were times that he did actually work for his uncle, but certainly just his uncle's understanding of the way that people reacted to certain information or the way that things were portrayed led a lot to how Edward approached his clients' problems and how he could kind of shape public perception in certain ways to act the way that he wanted them to. (laughs) That makes sense. So Edward graduated from high school in New York at age 16. He then attended Cornell University, where he graduated in 1912 with a degree in agriculture, which was his father's choice. Like we mentioned, his father worked in uh, as a grain exporter. So this this stuff always bothered me. Like I don't I I understand that parents want their kids to go into certain things. Typically, it's a lawyer or a doctor, mm-hmm. not usually an agriculture person. Mm-hmm. I know it's different times, and probably agriculture was a bigger. Well, it's still big today, but. Something that was aspired to, I'm sure, like, you get to control whatever from right. him. But, like, it's always bothered me that that happens with parents. And I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, I mean, I think at this time in history, like, it would have been a lot more common for people to follow in their parents' footsteps. Especially when you have, like, a family business. Mm-hmm. And the Eli Bernays did not have a family business, so it wasn't something, like, he expected Edward to take over for him. But it probably wasn't that uncommon for you know, kids to follow in their parents' footsteps just because okay. that's what they what they knew growing up. Is there a specific reason you think his dad wanted him in agriculture? Is it just because he was in it or Yeah, I mean that's what his dad did. He was a grain exporter and probably as we'll see, like Edward kind of tried to follow the same the same path until eventually he found his true calling. <laughs> So when he graduated from Cornell, he did begin working for the Manhattan Produce Exchange along with his father. He also simultaneously served as a journalist for the National Nurseryman and then became a co-editor for the Medical Review of Reviews and the Dietetic and Hygiene Gazette. And all these jobs all took place within the year 1912. First of all, graduating at 16 is impressive and then doing all this in 1912. (laughs) That's a busy year, even for a normal standard of somebody. Yeah, different times. I mean, it wasn't like all these were 40-hour-a-week jobs. Fair. (laughs) Although some of them probably were more. (laughs) Right, yeah. But, but yeah, no 40-hour work week at this point, no labor unions. So, like, still, though, you're doing all that work in one year. That seems... Super busy for a kid who just graduated. I mean, Cornell's no... You're not going to be no slouch to go to Cornell, but... Different times, too. I mean, most people didn't go to college, and so he was probably older getting into the workforce at that point. True, While he was with the Medical Review of Reviews, Bernays wrote a positive review of the play titled Damaged Goods. And this play was an English translation of Les Avaries by Eugene Brieux. This play centered around controversial topics like venereal disease and prostitution. (laughs) But Bernays described it as, quote, a propaganda play that fought for sex education. He wrote to the actors of the play stating, the editors of the Medical Review of Reviews support your praiseworthy intention to fight sex prurency in the United States by producing Brio's play Damaged Goods. You can count on us for our help. The medical review of reviews sounds super pompous to be honest. <laughs> I'm reviewing your review to make sure this review is good. Also, what is sex pruency? Uh, it, it'd be like, uh, I mean, America has pretty much always been one of the more Puritan countries. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, yeah. compared to France, where this play was adapted from, they're a little bit more liberal in sexual topics. <laughs> just a smidge. So just kind of the idea that... Um, in America, they would have viewed this type of play with these themes as very taboo, and this play was putting it all out there for people to kind of see the realities of what people might be going through. Oh, I bet that went over super well with the <laughs> uh, with the with the common folk. 
and the conservative views. Well, to help the play get along, Bernays established the Medical Review of Reviews Sociological Fund <laughs> oh boy. and began to solicit endorsements from, from important public figures of the day. People like John D. Rockefeller, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Reverend John Haynes Holmes, who was a name I wasn't familiar with, but he was one of the co-founders of the American Civil Liberties Union, um, the ACLU, for people who know it better by that. Is Holmes African American or is he white? I do not know. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm just curious because um, I feel like he's like he's obviously getting high society people, but I'm wondering if he's trying to pull from all segments for this type of thing. Uh, I'm not sure, but. I mean, you have to think, based on how we view the ACLU today, that they would have been in support of this type of play, right. regardless. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. He also garnered support from people like the Vanderbilt family, so just another wealthy family that would have had a lot of influence on the public view of the day. With Bernays' help, damaged goods became a success when otherwise it might have been condemned for the taboo nature of its topics. And Bernays had now found his true calling, public relations and propaganda... <laughs> <laughs> and he would leave the agriculture business for good. So how did dad react to this? You know, I didn't find that anywhere, but I have to imagine that he probably was in support of it. Like, clearly it's something that his son is good at. Maybe I'm, I'm portraying... I, I think you're, you're putting 20th <laughs> yeah. century, 21st century parenting here. I'm thinking I, of Eli Bernays as a supportive father. Yeah, it'll who, be fine. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. He, I feel like either he was really upset and then his uh, uncle, dad sibling <laughs> Sigmund came by was like no it'll be fine so I wonder if that I wonder if there was a lot of dynamic in there like did he talk to his family afterwards was he still on good terms with them I don't know I think that might be speculation like yeah. either I mean either way I guess it's speculation because we don't really know but I have to think that someone from let's call it higher society because they're a family of academics mm -hmm. um, probably was okay with him doing something that he was good at like clearly he had some talent in yeah. shaping the way people think. And, and if he's going to make money, yeah, that's it would be help. lucrative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If he's going to make more money than he did as an agricultural person, it's definitely going to help out for sure. So I guess we'll take a quick break right here and then we'll get into the career of Edward Bernays and how he really started to shape the field of public relations and understanding the way that people think and behave. We'll be right back. Look, if you've made it this far, we know you already love History's B-Side. But seriously, we just wanted to take a minute to tell you some ways you can support the podcast on our website, historiesbside.com. The first and most direct way you can support our podcast is by signing up for a membership. You can join at any monthly contribution level, but we suggest $10 to start. Though, please feel free to pick whatever fits into your budget. A membership will get you access to monthly bonus episodes, show notes, future episode cues, surprise gifts, and more. We also have on there our merch shop, which includes things like t-shirts, hoodies, hats, drinkware, bags, stuff for adults, kids, and dogs, so you can rep your favorite history podcast everywhere you go. You'll also find extras, including free stickers, bookmarks, and postcards, you can suggest an episode topic or submit a question about the podcast, one of our episodes, or even about us. That website again is historiesbside.com. And now, back to the episode. So we left off talking about Edward Bernays and how he kind of stepped into this new career in the field of power relations, which really wasn't like an industry at the time. Like that wasn't a job that people just had <laughs> here. Let me help you fix things. Yeah. But he kind of would learn to create this new type of industry just by taking a new route to solve problems <laughs> for businesses and for uh, organizations and productions and all kinds of different clients that he would eventually serve. Hmm. But he began his new quote unquote career as a press agent for other stage plays, performances, and even some popular entertainers of the day. So he actually like worked for celebrities. So is that was that a very specific angle for him to start of? Because he knew like, hey, they're big names and let me get in to manage an image. 
I think it was probably just more a stepping stone from the success he had with the damaged goods play. Got that it. like people knew that he could do that for a play, so it leads into you fix his other, weird sex play. Yeah. <laughs> you can fix me. Other similar clients, and that would be before he really took on any kind of like any client who would reach out to mm-hmm. him. When World War I broke out, Bernays tried to enlist in the army, but he was rejected for having imperfect vision. So that would have been me. Uh, <laughs> I got glasses. I've had Same. them since I was like fourth grade. But I also would have been excluded for flat feet I don't at one point. even know what that means. So apparently, like, so my I have no arch in my foot. Oh. So my feet are flat. And apparently that would have excluded me from joining the army at one point. Because you can't run? You'd fall over? I have no idea what the reasoning <laughs> was. I do know that, like, if I stand a lot, my feet do hurt. Yeah. But, like, they are, like, there's no arch whatsoever. So sometimes when I put on shoes, like, the arches kind of hurt. So I have to, like, <laughs> find a shoe that doesn't have a weird arch to it. <laughs> but, so, yeah, that would that was for the longest time. People who had flat feet couldn't get into the, couldn't get into the, the stuff. Do you know when they changed all that rulings, all that stuff? No, I mean, I'm sure there's, like, a lot of restrictions on things today, even still. Like, maybe not as much, but I'm sure there's certain things that would well disqualify you. Bone spurs can yeah, disqualify you, <laughs> uh, for, for apparently. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, flat feet is now, you can still serve if you have flat feet. You can serve if you have glasses. I'm just assuming that you can't serve in a specific capacity. Well, there you go. Point. You're not that old. You can... Yeah, you want to see uh, you want to see anger going on. Uh, my my parents would not be super thrilled if I was like, you know, what? I'm going to go join the army. Neither would my wife, I don't think. Yeah, they, probably they, not. They uh, they wouldn't want me being shipped off somewhere. And plus, I don't think I do super well in the uh, army camps and stuff. <laughs> I was I was I was a boy scout and I'm an eagle scout, but I was not great at camping. <laughs> Called myself the bare minimum Eagle Scout. I got ten days, ten days, and got my ten nights of camping or whatever it was to get my mayor badge, and I was like, I'm done. But it always snowed or rain whenever I went. I think weather hates me, so I wouldn't have been super good at the whole training thing and not talking back to the uh, um, commander. Yeah. Would have had a problem with that. Well, getting back to <laughs> sorry, we can you're delete. Good. We can delete all of that. Nah, you're good. <laughs> getting back to Edward Bernays. Um, Instead of joining the army, he applied to join the United States Information Agency, and he described this agency as, quote, the first time the United States was to use ideas as weapons to win a war. So it was kind of like a new tactic for approaching battle at this point. Like they, it, the, the key word that we're going to talk about in this section is propaganda. Okay, because I was going <laughs> to say, like, wouldn't Washington using spies and and crossing at night and using yeah, like so non-regimented tactics, like consider ideas as weapons for war? No, ideas as weapons is not so much like strategy, like military strategy, as it is just using public perception to got it. kind of shift ideas or that makes support sense. behind war, things like that. And that's not just in your, your own country, but in some of your foreign countries as well. Right. Um, and, Propaganda is a term that's, we're going to talk about this later on, of course, but propaganda is a term that's associated a lot with World War II, especially the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of why it gets that bad label. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But this was the first time that it was really a big part of the American strategy was using propaganda in World War I. But of course, because it's an American tactic, it's a good thing Mm -hmm. and we are in favor of it. So when it works for us, everything's great. Right. So when Bernays was accepted to this USIA, the United States Information Agency, he was actually the first and only person on staff that had any experience working in publicity or press, which was just his experience working in stage plays and entertainment industry. It's not a ton of experience, right? (laughs) Yeah, but like we said, this isn't really like a field yet. Like public relations is not a thing that businesses used until Edward Bernays came along. So his job with this organization mainly centered around promoting support for the war effort domestically and abroad. And at the end of the war, Bernays was actually invited to travel with President Wilson to the Paris Peace Conference, where he helped draft Wilson's 14 points to win the war, to win the morale of our allies, to win over the neutrals, and to deflate the morale of the enemy. I feel like there's missing a few, like, semicolons in there. Yeah, I think I copied that that quote from an article, and there should be, like, commas and stuff there, there definitely should be <laughs> like it sounds like he's just trying to repeat himself really fast and was well the the gist of it is that their their strategy to win the war was to 
win the morale, to, like to increase the morale of their allies, the countries supporting them, to win over the neutral countries, the, to get them on board with supporting their their cause here, mm-hmm. and to also deflate and destroy the morale of their enemy nations okay. as well. You just made it There's so three much parts simpler. To that. Yeah. 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 So this was before Wilson's stroke, correct? Yeah, that would have happened after World War One. Okay, because I never remember if he had it like when he was working on the Paris Peace Conference and, and trying to draft his like League of Nations. Yeah. Or... So <laughs> for very loyal listeners of History's Beast, I'd like yeah. go all the way back to our first episode. Um, I don't even know if we mentioned it in the episode or it was something that got cut out, but we talked about the fact that Wilson actually suffered from the Spanish flu while he was in Paris for the yes. peace conference. Um, so part of his like really bad health state at the end of his presidency stemmed from complications from that as yeah. well as like, cause I'm pretty sure I emailed you that question after oh, the yeah. episode. I was like, Hey, wasn't it actually part of this? And you were like, kind of, I think we had to cut that out. Yeah. But yeah. so this would have been prior to all that, of course. So was Ber- Bernays, is that I'm saying his name right? Bernays, yeah. Bernays, the main writer or editor of this of this 14 points he would have worked with a team they okay. yeah they had a team of writers and public quote unquote publicists who um would have put these kind of things together got it while he was with this committee he was criticized for his use of the word propaganda and in a press release reported by the new york world bernays stated the quote announced object of the expedition is to interpret the work of the peace conference by keeping up a worldwide propaganda to disseminate american accomplishments and ideals and I thought this was super funny when I read that quote, because again, I don't remember if we mentioned this on an earlier episode or maybe I said it on a bonus episode or something, but when Reed and I were in Munich um, a couple months ago, we took this tour that was all about the the Nazi presence in Munich. And it started by talking about like, he started talking about the history of World War One and World War Two and Germany's involvement in it and that kind of like what led to Hitler eventually. But he looked at me because there weren't like there's people from all over the world that were in this tour group and only like me Rita and one other person from the United States and he looks at me and he goes you know Americans like to talk about the fact that they came in (laughs) and just dominated the war but both times the wars were pretty much over by the time the Americans arrived what he didn't realize was they were going to lose without us anyway we had to come in and clean up everybody's mess (laughs) (laughs) but that's exactly what it is is that because of this type of propaganda right um we we had this idea that americans came in and won the war like yeah the, the allies would not have won world war one or world war two if not for the united states but in reality that wasn't really the case i mean we were important to it and we certainly helped the cause but like I germany like, was gonna lose anyway it, it's just delaying the inevitable <laughs> i feel like more for world war one that was the case for world war two though i really feel like i think what it came down to was the the nuke who developed the nuke first well, you're thinking of the the Japanese side. That wasn't it didn't right, affect Europe but, at all, right? I well, I guess what I what I mean by that is that Germany was developing that at the same time. Had they gotten that weapon first, from what I remember reading, they would have used it on us. Maybe that might or be. Or maybe a, I'm thinking, man, the High Castle. So <laughs> that might be a Amazon topic for episode. A yeah. later. <laughs> so funny thing is that when when you mentioned story from you's tour guide, I had these giant question marks. I was like, <laughs> what is he talking about? Some story from you. So. It's the thing you mentioned two episodes ago. Was or it two? Cover, yeah. Well, by the time this airs, it'll be quite a while back. It'll be way back yeah, but yeah. from when I listened to it two episodes ago. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I thought this would be a good time because we, we've kind of touched on a little bit the idea of propaganda as like a, a buzzword that we view mm-hmm. very negatively because yeah. it's like generally we associate propaganda with things that aren't 100% truthful. But yeah, it's propaganda is such a sticky word. That's the problem with it. And I think that's just from our, our 21st century perspective of the fact that, like, we associate propaganda with what Hitler was doing in Nazi Germany and counter to that, what the United States was doing to turn the war effort against Hitler in America. Right. And even people today, though, would say, like, even we were using propaganda for our own ends. A lot, they view our propaganda, a lot, some people view our propaganda negatively as well. Yeah, because um, we, I mean, the United States is just as guilty of it as any other country in the yeah. world, if not more so. Well, literally, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we definitely don't think this is a slip up of the word. You intentionally use propaganda. Yeah, but I think it's just the idea that propaganda wasn't a negative thing. And it really, it doesn't have to be. Right. As someone who works in marketing and like <laughs> tries to use public relations to our benefit, like it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of just 
tooting your own horn, but maybe in a stretching the well, truth type of way. The funny thing, too, is that propaganda also literally meant physical things. So yeah, I'm handing that's true. out propaganda to you. I'm handing you a flyer that has information right. that I think you need to have. The problem is that we're associating this propaganda now. Like even the physical forms are bad things, like when um, uh, the Red Scare was happening, for example. Mm-hmm. Well, but it's like you said, like the original version of it was just like information, advertisements. Mm-hmm. But because those kind of got twisted to be not 100% truthful thing, we now associate this idea of propaganda as like a negative concept. Right. But at the time that he would have used it, it really wasn't like a a bad thing per se. Yeah. It was just a very, it, I guess it would have been like the early version of public relations. Like because they didn't have this field of public relations, it was the idea of shaping ideas through, you know, physical media, like <laughs> actual advertisements basically I really wonder how his uncle was like taking some of this stuff like he's like oh that's a great word like you're using this how how cool yeah. with, with like <laughs> psychology stuff yeah i wonder how often he he talked to him about like i'm using this strategy what do you think uh i mean i didn't read too much on that but i'm sure i'm sure they i mean talked a lot about his ideas of how you can shift culture and yeah. Hey, people are sheep. They're going to follow <laughs> right. whatever you say and, and do. And like you said, like propaganda is bad when it's used by somebody against you. Mm-hmm. And we're also getting, we also get mad when like other countries steal our stuff and we haven't given permission <laughs> to do that. So but we do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. But it's okay for us <laughs> because, you know. We Good like old to, American. Yeah. America. <laughs> you know. But if you, I, I think, yeah, propaganda is one of those words that you, you just have to like take a step back from and like view it from a um a ten a thousand foot level rather than a right. direct level because if you're I'm looking at it directly in the face all I'm like is okay I just see this word and it's bad. Right. And it's like, well no, propaganda is not that bad. It's you just gotta It's how we use it. Yeah. Using <laughs> the correct context. Yeah. When you're talking about it. Ultimately Bernays big takeaway from his service during World War One was that the tactics used by a country at war to turn public appeal in favor of war efforts, convince neutral parties to lend support, and to turn opinions against enemies, could likewise be applied for organizations and people even during peacetime. Bernays spent the rest of his career as what he called a public relations council. He was available for hire by companies, organizations, and individuals to craft campaigns that shifted public opinion. He emphasized the difference between public relations and advertising, Now, today we would define that in our marketing classes or whatever as advertising being paid impressions where you kind of purchase people's attention through Mm -hmm. traditional media, things like TV, print, radio, and even social media. Um, Whereas public relations is more earned attention. It's driven by public perception and attitudes and just the way people think about a person or a company or a brand or something like that. And the funny thing is all both of these just fall under marketing. Yeah. Nowadays. I mean, there's there's other aspects to that as well, but the, the two that people most get confused are public relations and advertising and, like, how are they different? And that's that's literally it. Like, advertising is me, like, in your face. This is why we're great. Whereas public relations is kind of taking a roundabout way to get there and saying that, like, you know, other people feel this way about me, but why do they feel that way? Mm-hmm. So the, the analogy that I've seen, you know, memes of on social media or I've we kind of even talked about in our classes in college was just that it's like dating. So advertising would be like me going up to every single girl at a bar and saying, Hey, I'm a great guy. I'm devilishly handsome. You should go on a date with me. Whereas public relations would be something like, I have some really great friends who are going to go up to these girls at the bar and be like, see that guy over there. He's really great. So wing good man. looking, isn't he? So PR is the wingman. Yeah, but it it gets that kind of like word of mouth type thing that people get this idea of why you or a company or a brand is great and not the fact that like you didn't have to tell them directly. So should we ask Rita if you really are a handsome devil? See, and she, see if your PR campaign Rita works. Rita is my publicist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she tells everyone how great I am. Yeah. Hopefully. Like, hopefully it's not negative you PR. You the head down a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it's not, it's not bad PR. <laughs> you've seen Blade Runner, right? I have not. You've never seen Blade Runner? Come on, you've listened to the podcast. You know I don't watch movies. Is Still, that a movie? <laughs> if I've seen Blade Runner, you've had to see Blade Runner. I've not seen you, it. I'm surprised you haven't seen it in class at least. 
because the whole concept is that advertisements and companies have taken over. There's a big smog, but as this guy walks around, advertisements literally everywhere light up. Mm -hmm. They come into your home. Different things happen with it. So it's, like you said, in your face, and that just made me think of that. No, in my classes, we just watched uh, the documentary, The Greatest Movie Ever Sold, like six different times. (laughs) You ever see that one with... um, Alec Baldwin, where he's like the close, always be closing speech. I've heard that, but I don't know. We watched it for sales. That's the only part of that movie I've ever seen. <laughs> and I've seen it like four or five different times from work and from. <laughs> Not this work, a different job, but. Okay, sorry. <laughs> In 1922, Edward Bernays married Doris Fleischman, and together they opened their own PR office. What was the name of the firm? Is this still in existence? Um, I don't really no they just refer to it as like the Bernays public relations office i don't know if that was an official title or not i would guess that because he is well he's no longer alive but he retired at some point that there wasn't like a ton of employees beyond the two of them mm-hmm. i just was curious if like he built into some sort of big thing and it's like in new york or something still no i think he mostly just kind of worked on his own independently um it did say that his wife doris worked mostly behind the scenes like fairly quietly but it was believed that she actually helped to ghostwrite some of the memos and speeches and newsletters and stuff that this company put out and kind of worked out their campaigns. So this kind of makes me wonder who was the better of the two <laughs> and who really pushed the company forward, you know, competition and all that. And oftentimes you hear like, oh, this guy did stuff, but it's really his wife that <laughs> ran everything and she's the brains behind the operation. I mean, history would suggest it was Edward Bernays, but... You never know. Behind every great man. It's not the same. a woman shaking her head. <laughs> going, what did you do this time? Yeah. As an independent public relations counsel, Bernays' first client was actually the U.S. War Department. So <laughs> had some familiar experience there. Um, they were trying to persuade businesses to hire returning war veterans. So that was obviously something that he would be able to fill the role and work on. You think he was hired due to working with Wilson? Uh, I don't know if it was Wilson specifically, but obviously his connection to the USIA department. As a public relations counsel, Bernays would orchestrate some of his most influential campaigns. And we're going to spend pretty much the rest of this episode talking about those specific campaigns. Um, It's not going to be entirely chronological. I'm going to talk about some of the bigger, more shocking ones, I think, first, and then also include some of the just more interesting stories, of course. He really did so, so much that like <laughs> I couldn't even put all like right. come close to putting all of it into uh, this episode. But if if this interests you in any way, I definitely recommend reading up on him more. Because like I said, this was someone that working in the field and like going to school for this type of thing, I was shocked that I wasn't familiar with him until I started to research his topic just because. I'm really surprised that you guys didn't really dig into him more. So my degree wasn't specifically advertising and PR. It was marketing and management. But like still, I mean, I took advertising and PR classes. Like you think maybe it could have been one of those things that like his name was casually mentioned in a class and I just wasn't paying attention or didn't jump out to me like that. But I feel like if I would have heard some of these stories, like I don't want to say this guy would have been my hero because there's some sketchy stuff that we're going to talk about. (laughs) But like from someone who has an interest in the field, like he's definitely someone to admire. Yeah. Not so much like his actions, I guess, but just his influence. His influence and strategy. How brilliant he was in accomplishing these things is like mind-blowing. Just the grasp that he had on understanding the way people behave and how they're going to react to the things that he does. Right. This will be fun. I mean, some of them we talk about, I'm reading them like, why are people so dumb? Like, how do people (laughs) fall for this stuff? But that's literally how marketing works. Like right. you run some dumb campaigns and people fall for them and do them. The Budweiser what's up commercial literally invented a whole <laughs> new lexicon of word that we use. <laughs> yeah. My dad still says dilly dilly. And that was oh, what, like a, five I, years ago. Yeah, now. <laughs> really? Well, I'm not surprised that your dad is using five year old lingo. <laughs> so like we kind of talked about public relations wasn't a field at the time. While most people that would be considered public relations consultants of the time really only ever suggested things like advertising or discounting products. If someone was having trouble pushing a certain item, they would say, oh, we'll put it on sale or, you know, 
put an ad in the paper for it. And that's what these people suggested. And that's what they did. And it worked to some extent, but it still wasn't really like solving the major problems or making anyone stand out. Bernays took a new approach to this problem by finding roundabout ways of meeting his clients' goals. Now, I'm guessing you're going to go into more about this, but the roundabout ways? Yeah, that's kind of like what we're talking about with with the difference between public relations and advertising. Like, he wasn't, hey, buy more of this, buy more of this. It was, hey, this this is a lifestyle thing, and we're not going to talk about this product, but you're going to want it by the time we're done with this. Okay, that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. So the first campaign we're going to talk about, and this isn't like a huge thing to talk about exactly how he did it, but he was involved a little bit with politics, even beyond working for the U.S. War Department. But he aided Calvin Coolidge's 1924 presidential campaign by hosting these pancake breakfasts on the White House lawn, which (laughs) kind of helped change public perception of Coolidge. He was kind of seen as very rough around the edges, I guess. (laughs) He didn't speak much. Well, <laughs> you heard the famous quote where a lady bet that she could get him to say more oh, than yeah. three words, and his response was, you lose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, these these types of events, I guess, kind of softened his image and made him more likable and actually led to him getting elected. He also assisted in Herbert Hoover's 1932 campaign by sowing disunity among his opposition. And he worked with William O'Dwyer in his New York City mayoral campaign in 1946. O'Dwyer. It's a very what a name. Irish name, yeah. O'Dwyer. <laughs> and like we said, these are only going to be some of the main highlights of his story. He was obviously involved in a lot more beyond just those, and that's just the political side of it. <laughs> One of his most popular and, let's call it, deadliest campaigns, so we'll start to get into some of the bad stuff, um, was on behalf of Lucky Strike Cigarettes. In the 1920s, it was considered taboo for women to smoke cigarettes. Initially, when he was hired by Lucky Strike, they had a slogan that was, reach for a Lucky instead of a sweet. They were trying to market to women. Yeah, (laughs) that's interesting. Reach for Lucky instead of a sweet, so. Baking was obviously a very common women's role at the time. You know, they just sit around and eat bonbons all day, as my. Pretty uh, much. (laughs) As my folks would say. So Bernays, (laughs) Bernays attacked this slogan by you know, making it kind of front and center of their campaign. And what he did was begin to publish photographs of models wearing slender clothing, smoking cigarettes, publishing them alongside studies that showed the negative effect of excess sugar on the human body. So basically, if you smoke cigarettes, you'll be skinny. If you go for sweets instead, you won't be. (laughs) We saw that in the 90s quite a bit. (laughs) In commercials. Yeah, so Bernays really kind of created this idea of sex appeal for cigarettes you know women weren't smoking before but smoking could be sexy it really could be going attractive. back to his very first uh public campaign for that um play <laughs> huh he kept that in the yeah. back of his mind yeah i guess he's like these people will appreciate this <laughs> and this this campaign was successful but it really only helped encourage women to take up smoking but they really only did it within the privacy of their own homes it still was kind of a social taboo it wasn't really like necessarily accepted for women to be smoking in public i don't think lucky struck cared as long as they got the money well they did care <laughs> they <laughs> they wanted to sell more cigarettes so they had him work on it a... oh sorry i meant more that they didn't care if they were smoking in public but as well long yeah as they got the money it didn't matter where they smoked it yeah but if they were only smoking in their home then they weren't smoking as much as they could be <laughs> fair <laughs> yeah so they hired him again to work on a new campaign for them uh, to encourage women to be seen smoking in public And for this one, Bernays consulted psychoanalyst and actually partner of his uncle, Sigmund Freud, a man named Abraham Brill, to understand the societal perceptions that kept women from smoking. Why not go to Sigmund? Probably busy, Hmm. my guess. (laughs) Here, this guy's smart. He can help you out. (laughs) So Brill and Bernays crafted this idea that cigarettes were, quote, torches of freedom <laughs> what <laughs> it's a great like it reminds me of when we briefly rebanded rebranded french fries as freedom fries oh. or <laughs> <laughs> yeah but they were called torches of freedom because they were often smoked by feminists who kind of viewed them as a symbol of nonconformity and freedom from male oppression so cigarettes became sort of a feminist icon Bernays also organized a women's march at the New York City Easter Day Parade in 1929, 
which was full of lucky strike smoking feminists. Imagine women aggressively walking around smoking. Like, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to us, but that would have been like a huge yeah. sight at the time. Like that was something you just didn't see anywhere. It's like Miley Cyrus coming down on a wrecking ball. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you see every day. It's true. So local press caught photographs of these women smoking and the popularity of Lucky Strike brand took off as a result. How many people you think have been impacted by this now, since we now know smoking has its own dangers? Uh, a lot. I mean, if you want to talk about like, <laughs> yeah, how much smoking has kind of infiltrated society, and it, it's obviously tapered off you, as we've started to learn the health effects of it. But you remember restaurants when, yeah. like, you had the smoke? Michigan still has that smoking and non-smoking. I sections. hate going to states that have that. It just blows my mind. Like, <laughs> so obviously it's worked. That worked super well because we we've seen even. Growing up, you know, I've seen commercials, see all that stuff, mm-hmm. what they've done, but like, I couldn't, like, looking back, I'm like, why did they ever have a smoking section? And that section was, like, never full. But even still, like, people that do smoke, a lot of times you don't really look at, like, men and women smoking and think it's, like, okay for men to smoke and not women. It's just become people that choose, smoking obviously isn't as big a thing in our society now, but people that choose to smoke, you don't, like, it's not acceptable for men and unacceptable for women True. anymore. It's just kind of like you either smoke or you don't. Yeah. But the fact that, you know, we've gotten to that point where it's not necessarily weird for women to smoke stems from Edward Bernays yeah, shaping the pretty, perception of that. Pretty impressive. One more campaign that Bernays did for Lucky Strike was in <laughs> 1934, where they were hoping to boost the popularity of their Forest Green pack, which I think is just the color of the pack of cigarettes. <laughs> Probably. So Bernays began a letter writing campaign to encourage interior and fashion designers, department stores, and female societal icons to make green the fashionable color for the season. Galleries, balls, and other events began to follow suit, and green did become the trendy color of the 1934 season. I just pulled up an old image. It says, to keep a slender figure, no one can deny, reach for a lucky instead of a sweet, and it's green. (laughs) There you go. As a result, Lucky Strike's Forest Green Pack became the top seller among women. There was a lady on there with the kissy face, too. <laughs> and it is worth noting, like, I don't want to throw him completely under the bus because we're going to accuse him of doing some pretty bad stuff in this episode. But after he did semi-retire in the 1960s, he actually did work on some anti-smoking campaigns with pro-health organizations. And that's going to be kind of his thing is that, like, Edward Bernays works for his client. He doesn't necessarily take a moral stance on anything that he does whether it's good or bad um but if it's what his client wants he will do what he needs to to make their their campaign a success okay, so you kind of answered my question but like was this for monetary purposes or do you think he actually thought smoking was bad and felt bad he contributed to it he actually did think smoking was bad oh, he, really? yeah he himself never smoked his wife did at times but he also like it's, it's noted that he tried to get her to stop smoking, and any time he found cigarettes in his house, he threw them away or he tore them in half or whatever. So okay. even though he was working for this client, he himself was very anti-smoking. and So he could set his moral conflict aside for his client. Yeah, health. and that's, like, he literally viewed this as his job. It was something that he was very good at was, and I almost think of it as kind of like a game. Like, yeah. I mean, that's probably how a lot of people view their jobs is if, if it's something that you're good at, you, you try to achieve these different things. And it was each new client was a new challenge for him to how can I solve this problem? You look at, look at professional athletes. Like they're not these raging, violent people who look for a constant fight. Mm -hmm. For example, like a boxer, professional boxers are going around looking to punch somebody out for fun. (laughs) Like he sets aside his ability to do his job. In, in a normal everyday life. Yeah. And I'm not saying I could do that. Like, yeah, no. I, I do. I I think public relations is super interesting and it's something that I, I would enjoy as a career, obviously. But um, I would have a harder time with something that I disagree with morally mm-hmm. <laughs> to then kind of make that sound appealing. Yeah. But obviously it was something he could set aside and was very good at it. And speaking of things that are <laughs> setting aside morally, we're going to talk about probably his most notorious campaign now (laughs) oh boy (laughs) so for this one he was hired in the 1940s by the united fruit company to help boost the sale of bananas sounds so innocuous he's just trying to sell bananas i remember reading about this type of thing when i was like in (laughs) 
fifth grade. We didn't go over it. I just read the book because I'm a weirdo. <laughs> and so I was like, what the heck is this about? I I just loved, like, when I came across this, this was this story is what made me think, like, we need to include him in History's B-Side because you're like, his most notorious campaign. Yeah, he was selling bananas. <laughs> Simple enough. <laughs> so United Fruit Company at the time, and really still is one of the largest distributors of fruit in the United States. Mm-hmm. Today, they're known as Chiquita, Chiquita brands. Uh, I think it's Chiquita. Chiquita brands. Uh, Don't quote me on that because I'm terrible with names to begin with. So yeah, I might be me wrong. too. I think it is Chiquita though. And even if you're not necessarily familiar with the name, just hearing it, You've definitely seen it. Like, go to a grocery store and look at the bananas. If they have a blue sticker on it with a woman holding a basket of fruit on her head, that's Chiquita. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're still in operations. They still sell bananas. And I don't know, maybe it'll shift your opinion on what kind of bananas you buy after (laughs) hearing the story. (laughs) Well, the problem is they probably own the other ones that don't have a sticker on them. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So his initial campaign was to help them link the idea of consuming bananas with good health. Vitamin K. Is that what it is? Oh, potassium. potassium. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I've never heard of vitamin, vitamin K. Vitamin K. That's what they promote. Vitamin yeah. K and then potassium. <laughs> he also used his connections to have celebrities photographed holding bananas, which I think is hilarious. Like just walking around town holding well, bananas. Well, it's like or... that Got Milk commercial where they had yeah. the milk. So instead of the milk, they're just holding bananas but hanging out, right? I don't I don't view this as advertising. I think it was just like casual, like photographs that you'd see in a tabloid or in a newspaper mm-hmm. somewhere. It just so happened that the celebrity was holding a banana. Interesting. <laughs> He also encouraged hotels and other businesses to leave out complimentary fruit baskets, which were full of bananas. So, you know, you're putting them out there and then people get a liking for them and get in the habit of eating them. Really quick. You can delete this if you want this part. Is this the phrase where, is that a banana in your pocket or are you just happy to see me came from? (laughs) I, I, I would be shocked. I wouldn't be surprised considering what he's worked with in the past, but... This incident will spark a different banana-related phrase, but it is not that one. Okay. Like I said, delete if not allowed, (laughs) but I don't want you to get an E rating. (laughs) He also created an organization whose function was to promote the image of banana-growing countries in South and Central America. So he worked pretty hard. He realized that by showing these countries as, you know, good places where the bananas come from, that people would be more inclined to buy them. That's cool. In 1948, United Fruit ended this campaign that Bernays had been running for them, but he remained on as a consultant for the company, making over $100,000 a year. Holy crap. Yep. Just as, as a, a consultant. consultant. <laughs> we're going to end. In 1948. We're going to end this campaign that's going really well for us. We want you to stay on, though. That's how important he was. And this was just one of his clients. Like, he. This is a big client, though. Right. Like, yeah. They're, I mean, they're they trying can afford to it. dominate the banana market the fruit market but especially bananas right but especially bananas yeah <laughs> so Jeez. at this time guatemala had always been one of the most important producer companies for united fruits this country was poor and government was corrupt so united fruit was free to take advantage of lax labor laws and controlled much of the agricultural industry there in 1950 guatemala elected left wing president jacobo arbenz who began to crack down on united fruit and con- and its control over the region. Great job on that name. I would have got it totally wrong. I think I got it right. I'm not positive. I'm I mean, going to go with yes. <laughs> United Fruit assigned Bernays with the task of preventing Arbenz from enacting policies that would disrupt their operations in Guatemala. Which I think is crazy that they were like, there's this government in South America that is like causing us problems. You're a PR guy. Go stop them. Because that <laughs> doesn't seem like a PR type job. But No. It seems very counterintuitive, and also it seems super illegal. Well, I mean, technically not illegal. The way you put it, like, go stop them, like, but it makes me wonder, like. (laughs) I think it it just shows, like, what a problem solver he was, that they were like, hey, fix this. Yeah, we trust you to to get rid of the problem for us. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Bernays' solution was to begin a massive disinformation campaign to attack the Guatemalan government by calling them communist. Oh, boy. He flew reporters from major American media down to Guatemala, carefully curating their experience to portray it as a communist state. Their experiences were then reported to American audiences, creating the public perception that the Guatemalan government was communist, and United Fruit was a good American company fighting against communist oppression. Okay, how... Do you carefully curate 
a communist experience. I mean, I don't have specifics on what he actually did, but obviously United Fruit has a lot of people in Guatemala, so they could kind of like control who these reporters would have interacted and made it made it look similar to what you might see or what Americans think they might see in a communist state. Jeez. It's not exactly like Guatemala was a highly structured country that you could like walk in and see that everything was organized and running True. smoothly. But I mean, it's something, it's one of those, we would call it propaganda today, but the things that like North Korea shows their nice looking cities that are all completely fake because yeah. you can only see them from a distance type thing. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So articles reporting these facts were then reported in the New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune, Time Magazine, Newsweek, and the Atlantic Magazine, Jeez. which are, I mean, what, four of those five I have heard of and are still major publications? Yeah, I think the New York Herald Tribune switched to something else. I don't know. But yeah, yeah the Atlantic in particular is like, it holds itself up to like a higher standard. Yeah, and these were all publications that you know, fell for Bernays's tricks here. <laughs> wow. And it is important to note that these reports were entirely false. <laughs> Our Ben's government was not communist, but this communism was the great boogeyman that would spring the U.S. government into action. Still a huge boogeyman today. <laughs> Anytime something more liberal is pushed forward and government's labeled socialist, which can lead to communism, you see it on social media all the time. We don't want socialism because that leads to that socialism has never worked in any country. It's a very strong today, and it's 2021. I agree with you, and I think you're 100% right, but I'm going to play the devil's advocate here and say okay. that the opposite is true as well, that whenever anything on the right happens through, we start to argue that it's fascist. and That is true as well. That's <laughs> just kind of a, a political it's, It just makes me, it just makes that me we chuckle because I think about the, um, you had the red, I mentioned the Red Scare previously, yeah. but for those of you that know, the Red Scare was when one of the um, representatives in our government was accusing people left and right of being communists and setting up a committee to get rid of communists. Right. And the Rosenberg trials were a big thing of that. This was peak Cold War times. Like, Americans and the government especially were very suspicious of the growing influence mm -hmm. of communism. So to say that this country that we had, we were getting a lot of product from in the United States, to say that they were communist was like a big red flag, little red flag to the U.S. government yeah, that yeah. they wanted to intervene. Jeez. At Bernays' direction, these articles were then distributed to every member of Congress and other important U.S. officials. In 1954, the CIA organized what's known as Operation PB Success. I read that. Don't as ask PB, me where that name I, came I from. I read that as PBS Success, and I was like, public broadcasts. There was Station? another. It was there was another operation that took place before this one. It was PB something else, but I can't think of what it was. It didn't start with an S because I did the same thing. I was like PBS, but. It was PB, the first one was PB something else, and I can't think of what the name of it was. But yeah, so th this organization or operation, operation that they created was uh, PB Success. And in this, the CIA trained and armed a resistance group called the Liberation Army. Uh, oh, I think I've heard of them. Yeah, they, they were just actors in Guatemala who actually organized a manufactured coup d'etat that deposed Arbenz as president. And essentially led to a 40-year civil war in Guatemala. Jeez Louise. Yeah. And there are some historians that speculate whether Guatemala was on a path to a stable, structured government under Arbenz, but because of Operation... But because of Operation PB success, it spiraled the region into I'm gonna political corruption. I'm going to go with Prime Banana, is what I'm going to go with. As what? Oh, what PB? the PB stuff. Prime for. Banana. <laughs> Because it would be something stupid like that. Well, haven't you ever had a peanut butter and banana sandwich? I have. <laughs> I've also had a peanut butter and pickle. It's very good. That's disgusting. It's, I love pickles. They're delicious. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Regardless of what the long-term implications of this were, it's pretty clear that Bernays actions directly led to the U.S. government's clandestine plot to overthrow a democratically elected government. This has shades of the Monroe Doctrine all over this. And that was actually mentioned a lot when I read about this, that it had a lot to do with the Monroe Doctrine. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest, that's one of those things that, like, I know of, but I probably couldn't explain to you off the top of my head. So I'm going to plug another podcast really quick. It's called The Presidential Podcast. You guys can send your check to History's B-Side. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it's actually it was 
done by a Washington Post reporter. Okay. They go so they're through, not going to pay us anything. No, they're not. Sorry. <laughs> but they go through all the presidents and different things about them, and one was about Monroe and what's called the Monroe Doctrine. Basically, what the Monroe Doctrine is that President Monroe came to the Congress, came to uh, a, a House of Representatives and Senate meeting, and had this document printed off that basically read it and said that we will make sure that no foreign powers affect the Americas ever again. We're going to be the protectors of the Americas. And that means from top to bottom, hmm. that's what we we're going to do. Sp- specifically, the um, places like Central America, South America, we were going to make sure we got involved to make sure nobody, so we could let democracy flourish and yeah. they can see us. Kind well, of gives the government a big green light to do whatever they want. Right. There's very little statement of just what it is that we need to do to protect people, what, how this works and stuff. And so our government has used it quite a few times to do things like this. Yeah. And we are a big reason, and this document is a large reason why, um, or the excuse of this document is a large reason why the um, we have so much instability in Central and South America. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and it's not like Monroe was really like, this is how we need to do it, but because our government is the way it is and we, uh, we are the way we are sometimes, we've taken it and taken it to an extreme conclusion. <laughs> so that's – the Monroe document is essentials. Yeah. So if I got it wrong, you guys can come yell at me on my socials. But <laughs> Yeah, and that's Vince who is <laughs> – I'll give you my social media <laughs> later. Don't worry. Um, but – the only other thing to the story, and like I said, this is kind of the craziest story of the entire Edward Bernays campaigns, but the other thing, I, I mentioned that a banana-related phrase came out of this whole thing. Yeah, what is the banana-related phrase? The term banana republic to refer to like a, just a wacky, unstable, corrupt government, that's where that comes from. Which is a banana company now, or on bananas at least. No, it's a clothing store, isn't it? Well, that too. <laughs> it's a clothing store. But they also sell bananas. I'm pretty sure that I've seen stickers of Banana Republic on there, on like the Chiqu- Chiquita uh, bananas. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen that. But I, I but, swear. I could be wrong. I mean, when you hear like a country referred to as a Banana Republic because their government is just a mess and right. disorganized and corrupt, it's referring to this specific incident, in which case a banana company led to a coup d'etat. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> Another example of the Monroe document, sorry, is the Panama Canal. Oh, Okay. <laughs> We were like, oh, we need this. We're going to do it. <laughs> it's for good for everyone. So a couple more campaigns. We'll go through these a little quick, and these ones aren't nearly as uh, bad, although <laughs> they're not all great. <laughs> um, what did you have for breakfast this morning, Vince? Uh, actually, bacon and eggs. <laughs> My <laughs> yes, dad you had the me. good old American breakfast. My dad's a professional chef, so we had really good bacon and oh, eggs. Oh, I bet you did. Yeah. But... The American breakfast was not always bacon and eggs. At one point, <laughs> or actually for quite a while, it was essentially just juice, juice or coffee and toast. Oh, that's for people who are on the go, which is like 80% of Americans now. Yeah. But, I mean, when you think of an American breakfast, it's typically the whole right. shebang. Yep. <laughs> well, Bernays was hired by the Beechnut Packing Company, who was America's name. largest bacon producer, to promote a heartier breakfast. Bernays reached out to doctors around the country and asked them a survey that contained one question, whether a light or hearty breakfast was scientifically desirable. Which, of course, the doctors claimed that a hearty breakfast would be better. Six months after this one-question survey was published, bacon and eggs became the standard breakfast fare and beech nut sales boomed. Even that's embedded now in restaurants. Denny's has the all-American breakfast slam. There you go. Uh, What's... Uh, farm fresh all american at um isn't all isn't an american all american breakfast at bob evans or something i haven't eaten at Wild. either of those places in a while bernays is also responsible for the success of beer and the fact that we have bac or blood alcohol <laughs> testing uh so beer production struggled following the repeal of prohibition um we were mostly producing harder liquor at the time so A group of brewers actually hired Bernays to sponsor a program that would help develop a test for police to measure the amount of alcohol in driver's blood. He also helped to shut down places that served underage drinkers. And essentially, the whole point of this campaign was to make 
driving safer, which is one of his better campaigns, I yeah, guess. Yeah, that's, that's kind of nice. But what it did was promote this idea of moderation and the fact that beer was less alcoholic than hard liquor, so you could drink more of it. Hmm. And it's kind of essentially what saved the beer industry <laughs> following <wild>. Prohibition. <laughs> well, wow. Maybe not saved it per se, but really boosted its popularity and also you know developed these tests that you, you don't want to take when you're driving home from the bar late at night. <laughs> yeah, really. Bernays also described beer as, quote, a vaccination against intemperance. And really what that means is just that it was something that you could drink like, you could still be drinking alcohol. It just wasn't necessarily as strong as hard liquor would have been. Mm. Yeah. Another campaign of his was this idea of fluoride in water. Bernays worked with the Aluminum Company of America and the American Dental Association to encourage water fluoridation as... I don't know if I said that right. Fluoridation? Fluor, something yeah, like that. that sounds right. <laughs> he described it as safe and beneficial to human health. Now, did 9 out of 10 dentists say this as well? or uh, I think it's 4 out of 5. Isn't that oh, what it usually is on the commercials? It's either 9 out of 10 or 4 out of 5. Yeah, either way, everyone yeah. recommends it. Water fluoridation, if I'm even saying that right, is the process of adding fluoride to public water supplies, which helps prevent cavities and tooth decay. I'm not a dentist. I assume that it actually does help prevent cavities and tooth decay, but that could just well, be me fu- being susceptible I to mean, this public that's relations. That's what they use in uh, when they when they are cleaning your teeth. They do use fluoride. Yeah. So that, I mean, it it seems all good, and yeah. Hopefully, it's another just one probably of not as campaigns. strong of the fluoride as if as if they were. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Office. For sure. And for fans of the show Parks and Rec, there's an entire episode dedicated to this very similar idea where they're discussing adding fluoride to the water in Pawnee. And Tom Haverford is kind of like the Edward Bernays of that episode because he describes that fluor- fluoride water as H2 flow, oh, rebranding it in the cool Well, way. your listeners are going to hate this, but I've never seen Parks and Rec ever. <laughs> and I've never finished The Office. So. I mean, it's fine. Everyone has their own opinion on television Wait, did you actually watch both of these i had yeah i mean i've seen the office a million times i've seen parks and Rec a couple times but um i was recently pointed out by my sister that i made a mistake in our christmas episode because i gave matt the question about um who dressed up as black peter in the <laughs> dwight christmas episode and i said moe's and it wasn't moe's it was dwight's assistant nate which, if you haven't seen The Office, you wouldn't even get that anyway. Um, but... I don't think I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. What season was that? Uh, it was one of the later ones. No, it might no, have been the last not. season. Yeah. No, I haven't even. No, I haven't gotten that close. Yeah, but so yeah, if your listeners never want to hear me again, I mean, not because of these. <laughs> if our listeners are upset about that, then they're probably even more upset about me getting an Office <laughs> fact wrong <laughs> on like the quiz section of our show. Some other campaigns of Bernays, uh, he actually is the reason that people wear hairnets when they're working with food. He was hired by Venita, which was a hairnet manufacturer, to convince women to grow their hair longer. That's what they wanted him to do, was to convince women to grow their hair longer so that they would buy more hairnets. <laughs> and this campaign was ultimately unsuccessful in its intended goal, you know, getting women to grow their hair longer. But it did actually inadvertently result in government officials requiring hairnets for certain jobs. So I guess he kind of did accomplish the purpose. Wow. Well, then. <laughs> backhanded accomplishment right I, I mean it worked out so either way i guess Benito was happy with it one of bernay's longest and biggest clients was procter and gamble he especially helped them promote white unscented soap through sculpting contests and floating contests i don't know how the floating contests work i just assume that they floated bars of soap in the water but these campaigns were specifically targeted at children why children because of the contest yeah, I mean, I think the contests are more, like, kid-friendly, but just to promote, like, childhood hygiene, and that's something that resonates with parents well, I would assume. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. He was also hired by, and this is a weird one, so if you have kids listening, maybe skip ahead, like, a minute and a half or something, uh. but he was hired by Dixie Cups, which are, like, the disposable paper cups. Um, he was hired by them to push the idea that disposable cups were the most sanitary option, I guess, relative to other non-disposable cups um and he did this by linking subliminal imagery of an overflowing cup with images of vaginas and venereal disease i don't know anything else about this campaign i like briefly tried to look into it but i didn't i was worried what i would come across and i didn't look into it that much end up on a certain website (laughs) rita might walk in i mean 
not so much that. <laughs> it's just like, this was more something I didn't really care to read into further. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I just have LOL. What? <laughs> His uncle must have been proud of him, though. Probably. He had some weird theories. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that one was... That's an awkward one. I don't even I know how that works. Cups. Well... Now I'm never going to look at a Dixie cup the same way. You use them probably because of Edward Bernays. Uh, probably. Subconsciously because of Sigmund Freud. Jeez Louise. He also worked with a couple major events. Bernays hosted the first NAACP conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And we actually looked this up on our break here, but that Reverend John Hames Holmes that we mentioned earlier in the episode, one of the co-founders of the ACLU, also was one of the co-founders of the NAACP. Um, so that's probably where he got that connection from. His appearance at this convention is notable because there was no violence at it, which would have been pretty uncommon for racial based events right? Um, at this time period. And at it, he celebrated the important contributions of African Americans to whites living in the South, which makes me a little uncomfortable to think about. Like that's what we're celebrating African Americans for, but also given the time period and the fact that like he took these roundabout ways and that's something that would resonate with people in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. That probably was actually a really smart way to like prevent yeah. any bad racial instances. I'm, like, yeah, I'm really wondering what contributions he put forward and how he presented them. Well, I guess that's something we'll have to <laughs> read into more. Right. Outside I of mean, the episode. obviously, no violence, which is good. So he, yeah. he did something right. Yeah, and he did receive an award from the NAACP for his contribution by hosting this event. Cool. He also coordinated Light's Golden Jubilee event, which celebrated the 50th anniversary of Edison's invention of the light bulb in October of 1929. And he was the publicity director for the 1939 New York World's Fair. Hmm, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I wanted... World's Fair, are, I like. I hear about them like, that sounds so cool. And then like, I'm like, this stopped at some point. <laughs> yeah, that. I mean, the World's Fair is like something that I don't know enough about. And I feel like it's brought up in so many different well, parts of like cool stories in history. Yeah, that's where the Ferris wheel was invented, like showcased. There's like, that's where lights were like a lot of stuff that like we use or things that we know are like, I think the Eiffel tower was, was, was unveiled at a world fair. So it's like a huge event where lots of cool things have happened. We've talked about it on different episodes too. Like it was, um, where Reverend Burl Cannon wanted to display his Ezekiel airship until it got <laughs> destroyed. And uh, I know it's come up on different episodes that oh. we've done already. So, like... That might be a beast. Yeah, we need to look into the, who this guy, who the, the different world's the, the fairs. The guy or gal who invented the world's fair yeah. and how it's evolved and the importance of yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. I also wanted to include, because we talked a little bit about, you know, whether or not Bernays had these this moral aspect that affected his decision and his business. And he did have some notable rejections, people that tried to hire him that he did turn down and refused to work for. So at different times, he declined to work with prospective and clients, including several foreign dictators, the Nazi party, and even Richard Nixon, which I thought was funny that he was roped in with them. I would have loved to try to see him spin Richard Nixon's <laughs> Watergate scandal. <laughs> yeah, I don't... I mean, I'm sure he would have found a way to... He would have f tried to figure it out, but I don't... Not that, like, anyone involved in Watergate really, like, got a bad rap out of it, except for Nixon having to resign. I mean, they... Oh, there's a lot that went down from that. I know, but it... it he's the he's the big scapegoat. It could have been a lot worse. Yeah, oh, could have been a ton worse. <laughs> yeah. See uh, a very old episode of <laughs> the <Yeah>. Screws B-Side? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if it wasn't for that dang Forrest Gump. <laughs> yeah. Call him because that light was bothering him. <laughs> <laughs> the other big one, of course, was the Nazi party when they re requested to hire him. And even though he rejected their request, he was aware that they had begun to utilize his tactics for their own propaganda. And that's what we talked about. Just the fact that like propaganda has this very negative cloud around it uh -huh. in today's perspective. Um, and it's just because we think of how the Nazis used propaganda to convince people like, that Jews were bad or for whatever purposes to convince most of Germany to get behind their ideas. Mm -hmm. In his autobiography, Bernays wrote of the Nazis, quote, they were using my books as the basis for a destructive campaign against the Jews of Germany. This shocked me, but I knew any human activity could be used for social purposes or misused for antisocial ones. So he really just had a good grasp of what he was doing. And 
not, I mean, he was obviously very good at this, but almost anyone could manipulate public relations of this idea of making people behave in a certain way just through their beliefs or through the way that the world is shaped around them. Yeah, that's really interesting that, um, because when you sit there and you think like, well, you, you've taken some of these other items, you, you literally help overthrow a government, but now you're shocked that another group that's trying to take over stuff is using your stuff. Yeah. So it seems a little, maybe that's something that he kind of learned from, like, hey, maybe this wasn't the right thing to do. I mean, I don't know if it was that. I think he just, he was very smart and he was the first one who really pioneered this. And he knew that people were going to take his work and kind of shape it and use it to their own purpose. Mm -hmm. Even if they weren't always good people doing it. Yeah. And maybe his wasn't always good people doing it. Right. Bernays semi-retired in the 1960s, though he remained active with various low-profile campaigns. His particular brand of public relations was novel for its time, and it shaped the way that the business world operates today. His work was guided by the demand of his clients and a desire to shape and mold public perception rather than any defined moral compass. He paved the way for generations of marketers and influencers well beyond his death in 1995 at the age of 103. was not expecting to be alive from when we were alive. Right? That's super recent. I was uh, six years old um, in, in 1995. I mean, I was probably two when he died, but... Right. It's just 1995. I was like, what the heck? Yeah, it just feels so recent for, like... I mean, obviously, most of this work was done in the early... Well, not super early, but, like, early to mid-20th century. But right. still, like, the idea of public relations and propaganda being... Is, is really kind of a new concept. It, mm -hmm. It's not new because these tactics have been used forever, but just those as terms and understanding the way that they work is a fairly new concept. Right. Bernays also wrote several books, probably too many for me to list and include in this, <laughs> this episode. Like I said, this is a big topic, and if you're interested in just kind of this idea of shaping the way that people think and behave and taking a roundabout way to get there, it's something that affects us every day. Like, you can't go anywhere without being inundated with advertising, number one, and that's kind of what helps this idea of public relations fly under the radar, that you start to think and feel certain ways without even realizing it mm -hmm. through these kind of actions. But... Anyway, the, the main book that he wrote uh, was called Propaganda, and this came out in 1928, so titled before that really became like a super negative term. Right. But in this book, he talked about, you know, the influence of what he was doing, and he said, quote, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes are formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Yeah. A little creepy. <laughs> little, little too omniscient for my, my liking. He just, I mean, he had a really great grasp of human mind and, Really, of yeah. course, like so did his uncle. <laughs> so like right. there, there's some ties into that. But thing there, yeah. But like when you talk about it from a psychology standpoint, like you understand that that's them looking into the way that the human mind operates. Right. This is a business guy. Like <laughs> you, yeah. you think he's just looking to make a profit, but he's doing it in such a manipulative way. And I don't like that term because that has some negative it's, connotation. And yeah. and his story is. Like, obviously, there's some sketchy stuff about it. Like, I'm not trying to pitch him as a good guy, but, like, there's really nothing wrong with what he's he, doing, but it is super manipulative. He's definitely a complicated figure. For sure. That's a good way to describe he, it. He's, he's complicated because he's very, uh, you look at the stuff he does, and you're like, why would you do that in good moral conscience? But then you see things in his own personal, he steps away from certain things. Like, again, I'm going to help overthrow a governor in Guatemala. <laughs> but I'm not going to help the Nazi party. Like, again, I'm not equating our, our government to the Nazi party, but again, it's, I'm trying to take over something. I'm trying to take over something. I want your help. And from early on, he's like, okay, because I'm the consultant. You're paying me $100,000. No, I'm not going to do this because my moral conscience says not to, or I'm already retired by that point, or... Well, I mean, if put yourself in his shoes, if you were approached by the Nazi party or an innocent banana company. Yeah. 
<laughs> also, quotes around. Are innocent. you American or are you? <laughs> One's an American company, one was not. Yeah. So I wonder how, how how much clientele he took outside of American companies. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like a lot of his clients would have been American companies, but there's probably some bias in that as well. That it, he thinks it's okay for the, the U.S. government to overthrow a, a tiny country in South America, but or South Central America, but not, you know, help the Nazis. Right. Well, I think that about wraps up Edward Bernays' story, at least for this episode. Like I said, you could probably read a lot more on him. You might have to do another episode to go over more of his stuff. <laughs> I don't think people want to hear me talk about this anymore. <laughs> no more, please. <laughs> so normally we end our episodes with a little quiz. Are you uh, prepared to quiz me? Ready. All right. I'm sure, the, this, I'm sure these will be easy to you. We'll I'm, see, though. This could be bad. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back. We like to end every episode with a short three question quiz. And when I mean we, I mean the podcast, not myself, since this is my first time. <laughs> uh, but a short three-question quiz to test today's host and see how much he studied on his topic. And the listener, you can play along while you're listening. be cool if you actually went to the uh, social medias and tweeted out your answers at us. Because that would be interesting to see if in real time we kind of c- capture that. But I don't know how that might work. But I think you'd have to answer it pretty quickly before we yeah. <laughs> give away the answer. So call at 8885 <laughs> and just shout your answer. Yeah. Uh, or send us an inquiry if you actually did get all the answers right. So. When you hear the question, press pause. <laughs> write it down. Tweet at us or <laughs> comment on Instagram or something. <laughs> and then press play. Hear me get it wrong. <laughs> Laugh. And then... <laughs> and then hear the actual answer. Yeah. I'm I'm just I, I'm just making more complicated for Phil. Uh, but. I mean, it's a game. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. I should be an expert on this one, right? Yeah. So one of them is actually only about him. Okay. Two of them are about public relations specifically. Not great. All right. Ready. <laughs> Let's do it. What are the seven types of public relations? And we can do three to four if you'd rather. What? Like. What are the seven types of public relations? I don't know. Strategic like... communication. <sighs> media relations. Community relations. Internal communications. Crisis communications. Public affairs. And online and social media communications. I First figured you would have learned that in school. Yeah, I'm sure it's in a notebook somewhere, <laughs> but I was going to look and see if I have it like under my desk here somewhere still. I told you off air you're going to be mad at me for the first two questions. <laughs> I mean, that's probably something I wrote down like 10 years ago. I, or saw, the sheer I, panic on, I saw the sheer panic in face. I'm like, I'm just going to give him the answer. I don't think Edward Bernays was dealing with online and social communication no or... but he was dealing with he was definitely dealing with the um first six probably <laughs> i mean internal communications crisis public affairs community relations definitely so which one of those is overthrowing a government i would say crisis communications is probably because no, that, that more the... refers to like your client having a crisis they were having a crisis that the government I guess that's was true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> messing with their production operations i would say strategic communication is probably another one to help overthrow a government <laughs> all right this one might be slightly easier okay now this should be as part of your job as a uh Wherever you work, what are the four main functions of a PR firm? I don't know. I mean, I feel like I should know this stuff. It's somewhat similar. <laughs> Communication. <laughs> uh, communications in there. Crisis communication. It's the same question. <laughs> media representation. Yeah. Content development and management and social media management. I mean, I do all four of those things. Yeah. Under different names. <laughs> so, I, like I said, you're going to get mad at me for the first two. I should also mention that I am not Edward Bernays. Public relations is a very small <laughs> part of my job. Super small. Yes. So, Bernays wrote a book in 1928 about public communication, which you mentioned called Propaganda. <laughs> so, the original question was, what's it called? But it's already on there. So, can you guess the first two books that the propaganda came after 
Like the titles of them? The titles of his of his earlier works. There's two of them specifically. One in 1923 and one in 1927. Oh, no. I did actually read his uh, bibliography, or what do you call that? Like all the books that he wrote? Yeah. But... Uh, bibliography is correct. It was pretty extensive, so that's why I didn't include it. Just to rattle off a ton of <laughs> book titles, but yeah. no, I, I don't know what it was. Yeah, this says some of his earlier works, such as Crystallizing Public Opinion, 1923, uh, yes. and Public A Opinion. Public Relations Council, 1927. Self-titled? Is that like his autobiography? Uh, Although I don't think he would have written that in 1927. I don't know. Um, oh, bonus. <laughs> Who was Bernays' un- unacknowledged American mentor... Um, and his work, The Phantom Public, greatly influenced the ideas expressed in propaganda a year later. Wait, can you repeat that slower? The man who uh, was Bernays' unacknowledged American mentor, he had his, he had a book called The Phantom Public, which greatly influenced the ideas expressed in propaganda. Do you know the author? No, but this sounds familiar. Walter Lippmann. Wouldn't have got that. All right, well... <laughs> So, this is not a good quiz for me. <laughs> well, I will never be invited back after those questions. So it was great talking to all of you. Man. Yeah, that was, that was not good. I feel like I might have done better if I was still in school. <laughs> yeah, it I would have f- been perfect during school. I don't know how much you feel this way. Um, but like, since my degree is very similar to what my job actually is, mm-hmm. in some respects, I guess I should say, but there's a lot of like, terms that are like real marketing terms that I never use in my daily right. life. Right. And I'm like, I, I'll go back and like read something from a marketing article about something or other. And I'm like, what does this even mean? Like, what does this stand for? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All yeah. these abbreviations. It's I've like, done that with my stuff too. I'm like working. I'm like, what's this mean? And then I'll like, look it up and I'm like, okay, yeah, I do that. Now I feel dumb because I do that. And I just don't call it that. <laughs> Yeah, it's not the it's not the proper word, but you use the whatever slang for it. Yeah. Yeah. So we do this sometimes where we talk about whether or not we think today's B Sider was a good or a bad person morally, at least our opinions of them. <laughs> you said earlier that Edward Bernays is a complicated individual. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he was morally good or not? I lean on the side of probably morally not. Mm-hmm. Um because I can't wrap my head around a dude who is willing to work with a company to overthrow a government, but then be like, nah, Nazis are bad. So I feel like it was more... I think more... that's nationalism, though. Like, I think almost any American would be like, who cares what happens in Co- Guatemala? Like... Correct, but that still doesn't mean that still doesn't make it morally right. <laughs> so yeah. to, to me, he's definitely a complicated individual, as you mentioned about the cigarettes and stuff, like he, yeah. his own beliefs, but... I think he set aside his moral beliefs far too often in pursuit of money and doing this thing that he was good at to warrant him being he's if if there's a perfect balance scale he's more slightly on the bad side or mm-hmm. a more he's more amoral I think than bad. You know what I mean? I think yeah, I mean I agree with that. If we're talking about as Edward- most as most major businessmen are a lot of them are a moral to an extent because they want to get what they want to get. Yeah. I, I think he was very good at separating business from personal. Mm-hmm. And if we're talking about like him personally, I have a hard time viewing him in a good light just because like, I know I couldn't set aside like this thing that I'm advertising or shifting culture to be in favor of is wrong. Like it's something I don't believe in. So I would have a hard time doing that, but I can respect this idea of I'm doing a job, I'm performing a task. And that that's not the, in my opinion, the right way to go about it. Yeah, like that yeah. people give the same excuse for like almost anything that is wrong. Like, Oh, I was just following orders. Oh, I was just doing. Yeah. yeah. The Cause that, that's trials. Right. Yeah. That's not a good thing. But like he did have this distinction between like, this was my job and this is not what I truly believe mm-hmm. in. And that's something that comes up a lot when you talk about business ethics is yep. that like, do companies, do businesses have a responsibility to do good? And generally they don't. Like you can't really make a good excuse or argument as to why businesses should do morally good things except for good PR because right. <laughs> it does benefit the bottom line. So it's kind of like 
it's a really interesting argument, like whether business wise, what he was doing was good or bad. But personally, I would have a hard time justifying it. So I kind of lean towards he's maybe not yeah. the best guy. I think he was too easily pushing aside some, maybe especially earlier in his. Yeah, life. it's just the, the the comfortableness with which he could, yeah, like promote things that he didn't necessarily agree with. And I think uh, we we touched on that a little bit when we talked about Hiram Maxim. Obviously, you weren't on that episode, but Sir Hiram Maxim, who invented that gun, like the deadliest gun in history, was that he was someone who was trying to invent something that was good, and then it ended up, he ended up inventing a very destructive thing because there was money involved, or he had other motivations to do so, which we we knocked then, so I have a hard time like saying that Edward Bernays is good just for because very like, similar reasons. Just because you like the, cam- the not the campaigns, but you liked how I just think he's it. fascinating. I just yeah. think he's such an interesting story. So yeah, definitely, I mean maybe he's not for everyone, a character. but <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely a cool story for sure. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed having Vince on this episode. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll uh, hear more from him on History's B-Side for sure. Uh, If you guys want any more from the podcast, please feel free to check us out on whatever social media platform you choose to use. Um, Maybe you're already playing along (laughs) the quiz and hopefully doing better than I did. (laughs) All those, all those marketing undergrads. I hope you got those answers right. And I probably got them wrong anyway when I Google them. So (laughs) maybe, uh, maybe this podcast will get cited in some marketing classes. (laughs) That'd be great. (laughs) We'll send it to some uh, PR professors. But you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube at History's B-Side. Um, you could also write to us if we got anything wrong or you found this particularly useful for your public relations final <laughs> your <laughs> class marketing class. Good luck. I hope, I hope we can help you get an A. Um, but you can email us, historiesbside at gmail.com um, or however you want to interact with us. We're not too hard to get hold of. But yeah. we really appreciate you listening and we will come back with more history next week yeah thanks again this was fun (laughs) we'll see you soon bye-bye history's b-side is an independent listener supported podcast leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on facebook twitter and instagram at history's b-side send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at podcast at historiesbside.com. You can support the show by becoming a member or making a one-time contribution at historiesbside.com. While you're there, check out our merch shop, extras, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your host, Philip Hall, and my co-host today, Vince Collotti. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.